Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and welcome to WED. I'd now like you to meet our boss, Walt Disney. Hi, travelers. This is Space Mountain Mission Control. Please bear with us. Your ship is being prepped for launch and should be ready to go soon. Beware of hitchhiking ghosts. I am no chicken. I will not talk. You just remain seated and we'll be right with you. W. Your information station. Welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I'm your host, Lou Mangello, and thank you for tuning in once again this week. This is show number 43 for the week of December 2nd, 2007. News from Walt Disney World this week includes stories on two new quick service dining locations in World Showcase, new developments about the Western Way Shopping and Hotel District, and more. In the Walt Disney World rumor mill, I have some listeners submitted rumors about the DVC, changes to one of Main Street USA's original stores, Space Mountain, and are there big changes coming to a pavilion in World Showcase? In the next of my Legends of Disney Imagineering interview series, I have the chance to sit down and talk with a man who's not only worked on the recent updates to Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion, but wrote the definitive books on both of those subjects. He is Jason Sorrell, and his latest book is all about Imagineering at its peak, as he covers all of the Disney mountains. We'll talk about the book, Imagineering and the Imagineers, and Jason's going to give us the exclusive sneak peek on what major project he's working on next. Hang on to them hats and glasses, because this here is an interview that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. Walt Disney World is full of hidden treasures, and I love being able to introduce you to them on the show. While some may be small and relatively unknown, there are others that are hidden in plain sight. Disney's Boardwalk is just one of those, as it's filled with countless hidden treasures, including shops, restaurants, entertainment, and unique experiences. Listener Jamie Kersey joins me to explore the promenade in detail and familiarize you with all that it has to offer. I often talk about why we do what we do and the efforts of my DisneyWorldTrivia.com Dream Team project to give back to the community and help those who are less fortunate and in need of some true Disney magic. This week, I'll announce another of our efforts, and again, thanks to a listener, where you can help the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America and wind up with some great Disney memorabilia for yourself. And speaking of the Dream Team, we'll announce the winner of our Walt Disney World Half Marathon Challenge Contest, and Matt Hotchberg joins Eric Hollister and myself to present the clues to our next challenge. There's a lot of fun and interesting things to cover this week, so as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. After Thanksgiving, what better way to begin this week's news section than to talk about food, and turkey legs no less, because if you're looking for a quick bite to eat as you make your way around the World Showcase Promenade, there are now two new snack locations to feed your hunger. Named Promenade Refreshments and the Fife and Drum Tavern, they're located at the World Showcase entrance to Future World and the American Adventure Pavilion respectively. Both locations have the same menu items, which include turkey legs, hot dogs, popcorn, chips, pretzels, with optional cheese, ice cream, beer, etc. Both of these locations do participate as snack locations on the Disney Dining Plan, and they currently are accepting snack credits for all non-souvenir items priced below $4. Toy Story Mania, the new interactive 3D attraction coming to Disney's Hollywood Studios in 2008, has a new website devoted to it that just launched. I'll put a link up to it in this week's show notes, but there you can find concept art as well as some flash elements, interactive things, and a great video from Imagineer Tom Fitzgerald. Now, it is a Disneyland site. However, the attractions are going to be, for the most part, uh, pretty similar. Like I said, it's fun. It's interactive. It is somewhat of a placeholder for the time being, but we will keep our eyes open for new features that I'm sure are going to be added soon as we get closer to the launch in 2008. On January 10th, 2008, the Walt Disney World Resort will transition its kennel operations to an industry expert known as Best Friends Pet Care. 
They are a national provider of pet hospitality in the U.S. They have 44 locations in 18 states. And the conversion is going to occur in phases starting in January with the Transportation and Ticket Center and Disney's Fort Wilderness Resort first, followed by Epcot's Kennel. And then finally in February, Disney's Hollywood Studios and Disney's Animal Kingdom's Kennels. Now, what they are also going to do is build and operate a full-service luxury pet resort on the property. It's going to open in mid-2009 and will be located on Bonnet Creek Parkway. It's going to cater to park and resort guests, and it's also going to provide a full range of pet hospitality services. Now, with this, the addition of this facility, there are no plans to allow pets in any guest rooms in any of the Disney Resort hotels, with the exception of designated service animals. I'll put a link up in the show notes to bestfriendspetcare.com where you can find more information and visit their website. Speaking of expansion over at Walt Disney World, we now have a name for the Western Way development area, and it's for sale. Because for the first time in history, the Buena Vista Land Company, that's the land development arm of the Walt Disney Company, will be selling parcels of land for its expansion on the southwest corner of the property, formerly known as the Western Way Development. It's now named Flamingo Crossings, and it's going to allow private developers and merchants to build, run, and own small restaurants, stores, and several value-priced hotels. It's going to be located on approximately 450 acres and on the west of State Road 429, also known as the Western Beltway. Disney's calling it outside the Western Gateway to Walt Disney World, but actually all of the land is on Walt Disney World property. So what that means is that for the first time, outside companies can buy and develop land inside Reedy Creek. Now, other private developments of hotels and stores and restaurants in Walt Disney World have always been through long-term land leases. So a lot of these outside companies that operate some of these restaurants and are building hotels don't actually own the property. They only lease the land. That keeps the property under the ownership of Disney. Flamingo Crossing is going to be built in phases over 8 to 10 years, with the infrastructure construction beginning as early as January and hotels breaking ground possibly 18 to 24 months after that. There's going to be about four to 5,000 rooms in low to mid-price ranges. That's going to compete with some of the moderate hotels off property. The restaurants are going to be a mix of both fast food and some casual dinings, not common to what you'd find on Disney property, things you'd find off property like some chain restaurants. There's also going to be a three to 500,000 square feet of retail space, and that's going to really target the practical needs of both guests and cast members that live in the area, things such as groceries and day-to-day needs. This is also going to be in direct competition to the local shopping centers and some of the outlet stores that sometimes draw visitors off Disney property. Now, keep in mind that because all of the development is still on Disney property, Disney can ensure that the plans fall into their guidelines as well as their long-term goals. One thing to keep in mind as well is that this is likely going to allow these landowners voting power, something that stalled the planned residential community near downtown Disney back in the 70s. These new property owners can probably elect members of Reedy Creek government, something that's never fallen outside the control of Disney in the past. Now, that will likely have little impact based on the small amount of land that we're talking about relative to the tens of thousands of acres within Reedy Creek, but it is historical nonetheless. I've spoken about Western Way in the past, and I'll post it, I've posted pictures on the show notes for the show number five on March 11th. I'll put a link in this week's show notes to the past show so you can get an idea of what some of that concept art looks like. If you want to discuss any of these stories or you have news that you want to share, you can visit the WDW Radio Show message forums at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. You can also email me at Lou at WDWRadio.com or call the voicemail at 206-202-4WDW. I've said from the very first show, and I've reiterated every week since, that this show is for you, and I want it to be interactive to give you an opportunity to contribute and be a part of the show. Many of you have done just that, and this week, our first couple of rumors come directly from listeners. The first is from Tom All Jr., who said, Lou, someone I work with came across this and thought I'd share it with you. At a recent conference of timeshare executives, Jim Lewis, president of the Disney Vacation Club, 
revealed plans for future expansion. Among the sites he mentioned are Nevada, the Caribbean, and Lake Tahoe. Now, Disney recently announced their Hawaii development, so this all falls in line with what Disney had previously alluded to, in that they're taking their offerings beyond the theme park to experiences worldwide. This is a great this is great news for Disney Vacation Club members and anybody that's interested in purchasing DVC, because now above and beyond properties in Disneyland and Walt Disney World, you now have options elsewhere, such as Vero Beach, Hawaii, Nevada, Lake Tahoe, and the Caribbean. Catherine Hughes from Alabama wrote to me. She first has an update that I on a topic that I covered last week. She wrote, Lou, I just got back from Walt Disney World and was listening to your podcast. We visited the new Fantasia store at the Contemporary, and it was really nice. It's a long store with merchandise on two sides. A lot of the merchandise is similar to things found in other stores, but they did have some unique items, especially pins. We found some pins there that we never saw anywhere else. You also mentioned the rumors about FastPass. Well, we received a magical moment concerning FastPass and something that was mentioned on your show. On Thanksgiving Day, we were at the Disney MGM Studios. My husband went to get fast passes for Star Tours, and he was pleasantly surprised when a bonus fast pass popped out. These extra passes were for Lights Motors Action, and had a small window that could be used, like in about 10 minutes, but they enabled my family to see the show without waiting in another line. So that bonus fast pass system is being used. Thanks for all your great work. Catherine, thank you for that update. A few of you uh, other listeners also emailed me about some of these bonus fast passes that you have been getting for some time now. Sometimes they've been uh, uh, for immediately when you receive the fast pass others are for later in the day so it definitely does seem like disney is continuing to experiment with and tweak the use of the fast pass system now every year or so rumors about the rebirth of lost attractions throughout walt disney world seem to come back one month it may be about beastly kingdom the next may be about the demise of pooh's playful spot well recently rumors online have begun to swirl about the rise of japan's mount fuji roller coaster coming back now, while I have not heard anything personally about that specifically, I have heard something else that may just have some teeth to it. For years, there has been discussion and debate about World Showcase's its attractions, or lack thereof. We've covered in the past some of the lost concepts that still have Disney fans watering at the mouth, such as the aforementioned roller coaster in Japan, the Swiss Pavilion, Pinocchio Village in Italy, the Africa Pavilion and its many attractions, and so, so much no more. All of these have been very, very well documented. But of all these lost attractions, one was closer than most, insofar that it actually had its show building constructed. And I'm talking, of course, about the Rhine River Cruise in Germany. Now, if you look at the pavilion from the promenade and look to the left, you'll see a large set of double wooden doors right to the left-hand side of the plaza. Behind this is a show building for what would have been a multi-million dollar ride through the German forests among, along the Rhine River, as well as others throughout Germany. You would have passed scenes that included Oktoberfest and the Ruhr Valley and so much more. Now, while the, building still, the show building still remains, it has only really been used for utilitarian tasks through the years, such as for storage, construction, rehearsals, etc. Well, recently, I've learned that Disney may have taken an interest in this building once again, possibly going so far as to have a number of people scouting the interior and exterior of the pavilion and what's behind those large wooden doors. Now, I have no specifics as to what may be planned, although we have all heard the old adage that no good idea at Imagineering is ever lost forever, forever so who knows? This is something I'll be keeping a very close eye on and will be tapping into some of my sources for more information. I don't think that we'll necessarily see what may have been originally planned for more than 25 years ago as technology and pop culture and so much more has changed and evolved through the years, but I believe that the possibilities here, if Disney decides to do something, are almost limitless because there's so much to highlight about the German culture that the pavilion really in its current state can't adequately provide through the shops and restaurants. It would, of course, add another uh, potential big draw to the backside of the park, as well as maybe, depending on what kind of ride or show they put in there, give kids another ride experience in World Showcase. So, like I said, we'll definitely be staying uh, very closely tuned to this for any more information as it develops. Next rumor comes from listener Laura from Minnesota, who wrote, Lou, while, I'm, while I was at the Chapeau getting the multicolored character blazoned ears it stitched for my son, I get a different pair each year for him, I asked the cast member doing the stitching how long it took her to learn. She said that she only had two hours of training, but lots of practice. I believe she said she'd been doing it for more than 15 years, but don't quote me on that. 
She also said that next year they won't be hand stitching anymore, that it will all be done digitally. She told me that the shop would be expanded and new equipment brought in, but it didn't sound like to me that it was a digitally controlled stitching, but rather printed on. This is one rumor that I hope is not going to be true. The Chapeau is my first stop each year, and I'd be very disappointed if stitching is no longer available. Now, for those of you who are not sure what we're talking about, the Chapeau, the hat shop on Main Street, on the right-hand side as you walk into Town Square, has, for since the Magic Kingdom opened, been stitching Mickey ears, you stitching names on the back of Mickey ears by hand. Other locations throughout Walt Disney World now use an electronic system where they put the name in, they type the name in, and the machine stitches it automatically. The Chapeau is the last shop, as far as I know, that still stitches these by hand. This is the first rumor that I've heard about moving to a completely new type of system. Like you, Laura, I hope that's not true. There, there's something about having these hand-stitched on that has a very nostalgic, classic look to it that I really enjoy. But again, we will keep um, our eyes on this, or ears, as the case may be, uh, as this develops. Now, this is something else I have to report as a rumor since it's not officially from Disney, but it does come from a reliable source, and it's a couple of things that haven't been officially announced as yet. You probably already know that on New Year's Eve in the Magic Kingdom, it's actually going to be not one, not two, but three nights from December 29th through the 31st, and that in addition to holiday wishes at 8.30, there's also going to be Fantasy in the Sky fireworks at 11.50. Now, the rumor that I've also heard is that at this time, Fireworks are also going to be launched from the center of the Seven Seas Lagoon to correspond with Fantasy in the Sky. Not only that, Park Maps and the Disney World website lists that the Magic Kingdom is going to be open till 1 a.m. What I'm hearing is that the park is going to be open till at least 2 a.m. on all three of those nights as well. Finally, rumors of the Space Mountain Rehab in 2008 have generated a lot of emails recently, especially about the length and the scope of the refurbishment. I discussed this on a number of shows, including details about how new lighting was currently being tested. There are rumors that Space Mountain might be down for as long as a year. Uh, while the refurb does seem to be a fait accompli, and it looks like it's definitely going to happen, I do not believe it may be as extensive as some people have speculated in their questions to me. Now, supposedly there are rumors elsewhere online that the entire top of the mountain is basically going to be sliced off, allowing Disney to basically rip out all the structural elements of the attraction and rebuild it from scratch. Uh, and that kind of this gaping hole at the top of the mountain is going to lower the new track in. I've heard nothing to confirm that, but I did want to address it because I did hear it from a number of listeners. Uh, it does seem to go against somewhat what I had heard in the past, but I'll, we will all have to wait for really a formal announcement from Disney as to what may or may not happen to Space Mountain before we pass judgment on what, uh, on what really is going to take place. But then again, that's really the fun about talking about rumors, isn't it? It gives you, as a guest and a fan, the chance to play sort of armchair imagineer and wonder about some of these wild rumors, speculate on what may be coming, and possibly even motivate you to go back to Walt Disney World sooner than you may have planned in order to catch your last glimpse of one of your favorite attractions like Space Mountain uh, in its current state before it does go down. So if you have a rumor that you want to share... By all means, email me, call the voicemail. Again, discuss any of these rumors in the WDW radio show forums over at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. I'll put a link on the homepage of WDWRadio.com that'll take you right over to the message forums where you can discuss the news, rumors, and anything that you've heard on the show. As I said from the very first show, I always wanted the WDW radio show to be interactive and that I encouraged you, the listener, to be as much of a part of the show as you'd like. And many of you have done just that via emails and voicemails, and some of the others have even contributed segments and ideas to the show. Well, one such idea for one of Walt Disney World's hidden treasures came from a longtime listener, and keeping to my word, I'm having him come on the show to talk about it. So I want to welcome longtime listener Jamie Kersey to the show. Hey, Lou, how are you? Good, good, Jamie. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Jamie, we had a, a chance to meet face to face um, earlier this year at the Magic Meet event in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. 
And kind of after corresponding via email a little bit, you came up with what I think is a great idea for one of Walt Disney World's hidden treasures. It's one that I wholeheartedly agree with and that definitely qualifies as one. And it really kind of also includes some of Walt Disney World's best of the best to a certain degree. So, Jamie, since this was your idea and it was your email, why don't you go ahead and tell us what your concept was for this next uh, hidden treasure? Absolutely. Thanks, Lou. The idea that I had was to introduce Disney's Boardwalk Resort as a hidden treasure. Uh, My family and I belong to Boardwalk as DVC members, and we've been there since 2001. And for anybody who is familiar with DVC and knows about the home resort and the fact that there are several different resorts you can choose from, I have to admit that we continue to keep going back there. Um, From the theming to the location to the restaurants, to the shopping and just the general atmosphere of the boardwalk itself uh, just makes it an absolute blast um, and we continue to go back. Yeah, the boardwalk, even above and beyond, even if you don't stay at the resort or stay at the villas, the boardwalk itself and the promenade has so much to offer and we're going to talk about all the different things and all the different aspects of the resort and um, the, the kind of the, the boardwalk itself. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about the history of the boardwalk. It opened back in 1996. It was designed by uh, architect Robert A.M. Stern, and he really, according to him, wanted it to be what he considered a village across the water and a place for people to go to kind of rest away from the hectic pace of the parks. And what he did was he modeled it after the turn-of-the-century seaside towns that you'd find in places like New England and the Mid-Atlantic states, And you can see a lot, if you're familiar with it, I'm from New Jersey, you can see a lot of the old Victorian Cape May in there. And, you know, I spent time with my parents who grew up in Brooklyn over in Coney Island, and you definitely feel a lot of those elements there, uh, both architecturally and even things like the Surrey bikes that you can take, um, all the kind of things that you'd see along the Jersey Shore. Absolutely. There's the element of Coney Island there. I think there's also uh, a bit of a reminder of Atlantic City itself just by the term boardwalk. Uh, for anybody that may have been down there or vacationed in the area, uh, it is very reminiscent of those places. Minus the casinos and the crime. Other, other than that, it's exactly like Atlantic City. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but uh, you, you, meant, you made mention of one thing, and I've talked about this at length before, is location, 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 because it's located on Crescent Lake, which is beautiful in and of itself, right across the the way from the Yacht and Beach Club. But uh, more importantly, you're within walking distance to two theme parks. You have Epcot and MGM slash Hollywood Studios, as well as other resorts, like I said, like Yacht and Beach Club. You've got the Swan and the Dolphin. So, I mean, location-wise, Jamie, I mean, you you really almost can't make an argument for for it not being ideal. No, I would totally agree. Um, You know, whether you have plans at either one of those parks or you want to maybe start out um, your day or your evening at Boardwalk and then continue on to MGM to be able to experience Fantasmic or move on to Illuminations at Epcot. Because of all the restaurants, uh, we've taken um, the opportunity to go back on some nights, have dinner at Boardwalk, and then return for Illuminations at Epcot. Exactly, and that's the beauty of it. You can walk through um, right out of World Showcase through the International Gateway. It's maybe a five- to seven-minute walk um, beautiful views, really a, a great view of the boardwalk, sort of as you kind of crest over the hill and kind of get the expanse. You have the boardwalk to the left and the yacht and beach club and the, the lighthouse to the right. And we should stress, too, for people that maybe have never been there before, you, like I said, you don't need to be staying at any of these resorts to enjoy and experience the boardwalk, whether it's daytime or at night. You, like I said, you can walk from the, either of the theme parks. You can also park over at the boardwalk. Um, there's no admission fee itself. If you're a Disney guest, you can self-park for free. If you want a valet park at the boardwalk, you can do that as well. That's usually around $10, but you might not know if you are a DVC member or if you have a Disney dining experience card. If you're a pass holder or Florida resident, valet parking is free. So you can pull right up to the boardwalk, tell them that you're going to go eat at Spoodle, so just kind of walk around and enjoy the boardwalk that way. Don't have to worry about parking at Epcot and walking or anything like that. You can park right over there at the boardwalk. That's absolutely correct, and, and not that I'm ever encouraging people to stay off property, but that's always a good way, too, if you're going to be going to one of the theme parks and you want to be able to avoid that parking charge. Absolutely. So as far as the boardwalk itself, Jamie, um, I, what I really did was I kind of look at it 
as having three distinct features, and we'll kind of hit each one of these individually. I think the, the entertainment aspect, as well as all the different dining options, and then finally the shopping. Um, there, there is some nice and very unique shopping there, um, one store in particular that we should highlight. So let's talk about the, the entertainment first, because there is so much to see and so much to do, especially at night. And you're going to find things there, and you're going to find venues there, very, very unique to the boardwalk. Um, that you won't find anywhere else, whether it be things that you see performers on the promenade itself or some of the different buildings and clubs that you can go to. You want to start inside or outside? Let's uh, let's start with, with maybe some of the individual venues themselves. Let's kind of start on one end and work our way down, and we'll start with maybe the Atlantic Dance Hall. Okay. Well, that's something... Uh, I'd be lying if I told you I was a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> but I have looked inside before, um, and, and it is very, very impressive. It's, it's a large area. Um, well, David, I, I'm certainly not going to say that I am a dancer because I, I can only hear the, the jokes and emails coming, but I have been to the Atlantic Dance Hall um, <clears throat> for quote-unquote research purposes um, <laughs> on more than one time. I was not wearing cavalry cheese or parachute pants, I can assure you. But you're right. It, it's, a, it's a very elegant nightclub, and there's a, a lot of different types of music that's played there. There is a DJ. They always have different kind of dance parties going on. Uh, very nice Art Deco interior. And uh, if you look very carefully uh, up at the ceiling, you'll see that there's sort of uh, twinkling stars. Some nights they have um, dueling DJs. They have video DJs, a, a big screen, a couple of bars. A really nice place to sit outside, too. Go there at dusk or go there at night, and it's beautiful sitting outside and looking over Crescent Lake. Um and they, like I said, they play music from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They have uh, great parties for New Year's Eve, especially if you're going to go looking for a place to go this New Year's Eve, don't want to spend it in the theme parks. The Atlantic Dance Hall is a great place to go. Uh, we should mention that you do need to be over 21 in order to get in. Um, and again, you don't need to be a dancer, Jamie. So no, there, no. There, there is a research trip in your future, I see. <laughs> Well, it's funny you mentioned the 21, and that's unfortunately an element I haven't had to deal with in quite a long time. <laughs> but uh, when you talk about the DJ element, I wanted to mention, too, for folks that might be into live entertainment, I do know that they have live bands playing a lot of dance music from time to time, too. Yeah. Yeah, I really so like a lot of fun. Yeah, I really like the Atlantic Dance Hall. Definitely a place you should go and check out, uh, even if you want to just kind of walk in, take a look around, and, and then and then leave. But right across from there is, is a really, really fun place. I'm sure you've been here before because you don't need to dance, and that's Jelly Rolls. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny, say, have, having been to before, but this uh, last visit that we had made to Boardwalk in October was my first time going into Jelly Rolls, and I can't believe I hadn't been in there before. It's an absolute blast. They've got the two pianists uh, on the stage setting, so to speak, with this slanted mirror so that the folks in the audience can watch them perform their fingers moving across the piano uh, as they go back and forth at one another. It's a real good time. Yeah, definitely some places. It's a very interactive uh, type of environment. If you want it to be that way, if you want to get you know, involved and you want to sing, they play all kinds of classic songs. Um, the, the other thing that's nice about Jelly Rolls, too, that I think a lot of people might not realize is that in addition to the full bar, you can also get some food in there, too. They do have appetizers that you can get. Uh, so if it, you know, it is getting late and you start getting hungry like I do around midnight, want something to eat, Jelly Rolls is, is a lot, a lot of fun. Um, and again, no cavalry cheese or parachute pants required. No, but you can definitely <laughs> work up an appetite with all the sing-alongs, that's for sure. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And here's, here's a little bit of trivia, a little did you know. Do you know where the name Jelly Rolls came from? I knew you were going to do this to me for one. Uh, Stop Googling. Stop Googling. Okay. <laughs> Does it have to do with donuts at all? No, but but now that you've got me thinking about Krispy Kremes, um, no, Jelly Rolls is actually named after Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton, who was a, uh, a ragtime jazz pianist, and he was a composer, um, very, very influential in jazz music um, in, in the early 1900s. So that's your, that's your little did you know for today but uh, next time I go back there you go so next place sort of entertainment venue sort of slash food venue if you're not into the music you're not into the dancing you're not into all that um, you just want to go and plop yourself down and catch the game there's no better place to go than the ESPN club absolutely um, the ESPN club was probably one of the best reasons when, when we signed up for DVC that we had chosen the boardwalk uh, knowing that we were going to have that there. Uh, the food is really good. It's reasonably priced. Um, the place is huge. And um, 
and that's not just uh, you know the area where you can sit, but the TVs themselves. I, I want to say that there's something like over 100 televisions right. yep. within the establishment, alone, including the restrooms, by the way. <laughs> if, if, you, if you need to be watching the whole time that you're there. <laughs> but I did hear a, a rumor a while ago, and I wanted to ask you if there's anything new to this, and I hope the answer is no. But in the downtown Disney area where Disney Quest is located now, I had heard maybe a year ago there were plans to maybe turn that building into a full-blown ESPN zone similar to what you have in New York City and Baltimore and Washington. Right, and that's something that, that I had actually talked about on the show, something I had heard as well. Uh, believe it or not, within the last couple of weeks, I'd started to hear that they were actually going starting to do some very, very slight renovations and refurbishments in Disney Quest. So that gives me pause and makes me wonder if they're doing it in anticipation of making some wholesale changes inside, or are they really going to spend that kind of money if they're eventually going to take it down and, and make it uh, into a full-blown ESPN zone? Um, I think where the ESPN club is is great because you have such direct access to so many hotels right there. If people want to get away, if they want to go and enjoy a game, um, and again, it, it's more than just that because there's stuff for the entire family to do. There's video games next door for the kids. There's um, a big ESPN store if you want to shop and bring home some souvenirs that way. And I agree with you. The food um, is very, very good for what it is. You got things like, uh, of course, hamburgers and you can get a bucket. I mean, literally a bucket of chicken wings. They've got the Booyah Chili. Lots of salad and sandwiches, things like that. Um, again, someplace I really, really enjoy going. If you want to go there and catch a football game, for example, you need to get there early because a line starts forming before the restaurant even opens in the morning. Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, when we were there, it was um, second week. It was Columbus Day week in October, and we happened to try to get over there the night. It was Monday Night Football, and the Dallas Cowboys were playing, and that might be just enough to know how crowded it was going to be because I think for everybody that was there, they were either Dallas fans or they hated the Dallas Cowboys. It didn't matter who else they might have been rooting for, but the line was out the door. Now, the trick that we learned, because the line was actually uh, more for the bar than it was for the restaurant, and if you were to tell the person at the front that you just wanted to go out and have something to eat, then they'd be willing to bring you to the dining room. And all you'd have to do really is just to order um, french fries, and you'd be able to sit down. So just the thought, if you're there and you see a line, figure out whether or not it's for the bar or the restaurant, and that might give you an opportunity to get in there faster. Absolutely. Good. That's, a, that's a great tip. And the one thing I should say, too, is that if you're going for a quiet, romantic evening with, with a uh, someone you love, ESPN Club is not the place for it, uh, especially no. if you sit in the dining area. They do a lot of live broadcasts from there, from, from ESPN Radio, some of the other different uh, ESPN properties, and it's very, very loud in there. Um, and, and again, you can it, it gives you a chance to interact if you want to be part of the show, but it's not the place for, for a quiet meal by any stretch of the imagination. So um, know that going in beforehand. So... In addition to those three specific venues, and I'll call them kind of entertainment venues, there's a lot more going on, like you said, outside of there. A lot of things going on on the promenade itself, and lots of things that you can do or watch or become a part of. Although I've never participated in sword swallowing, it is kind of fun to watch. <laughs> I was thinking, well, right, I though, was thinking they're... renting Surrey bikes when I said interact and be a part of, but... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but no, you're, you're, you're right. Um, well, there, there's the entertainment that you can watch, um, between the jugglers, there are tarot card readers, um, there's usually some musicians of some sort performing out there, and you have a lot of games that you can play from, whether it's uh, a game that my son has me play all the time, which, you know, the water gun shooting into the clown's mouth and, you know, having the balloon rise to the top, there's shooting basketballs into hoops, things of that nature, but if you want to actually get involved and, um, you know, take advantage of what the the whole area has to offer really the, the bikes are great you can take them all the way around the lake um so it's getting onto the beach and yacht club property although i gotta warn you there's a couple of steep hills there so if you get something that's you know a four-seater and you're the only one that's planning to pedal you're going to be in some <laughs> trouble <laughs> yeah good but um in addition to the bikes one thing that i've done a couple of times is going over to the marina on the opposite side of the lake over where the yacht club is 
and rented, I call them mouse boats. I, I think they're technically sea rays, but they're the two-seater boats that you can rent for somewhere around, I think it's $20 for about a half an hour, and you have essentially unlimited access of that area that's in front of you. Uh, you can bring anybody with you as a passenger. I brought my two-year-old, had an absolute blast just kind of uh, scurrying around the lake. And there are some rules that you need to follow, but, um, but it is pretty neat to just kind of be out there. I agree with you, and you've, I'm sure you've heard me talk in the past about some of the things that you can do from the marina, one of which is breathless. Actually, now it's breathless, too, which Correct. is uh, a large, it's not a Chris Craft anymore. Um, gosh, I forget the name of the type of boat it is, but you can go out with the captain um, on this old sort of 1920s wood boat, absolutely beautiful. You can take illuminations, cruises. They'll take you all around Crescent Lake. They'll park you under the bridge by the International Gateway. If you take something like Breathless, they'll take you all around uh, by the MGM Studios, and they'll really open that boat up if you want them to. You can fit about six or seven passengers in there. You can even take out a fishing charter uh, yep. on a pontoon boat if you want to, If that's a little bit more your speed. You want to just kind of go out fishing. We're just going to tool around the lake a little bit. They have the, the pontoon boat. Um, uh, back onto the other side of the promenade, you want to take a bike. You want to take a Surrey bike like we talked about before, something that you'd see on the Coney Island or the Atlantic City Boardwalk. Um, really something nice you can do with the whole family. It's not that expensive at all and a very kind of unique experience that you can't find anywhere else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that fishing trip, by the way, that's on my wish list. I haven't done it yet. But um, I think that just sounds like a lot of fun. Research trip. I'm telling you, research exactly. trip. Exactly. <laughs> But I, don't have a, I don't have a radio show yet, though, so I don't know what my research would be. <laughs> You're on here now once, so that qualifies. Anything now is a research trip. So Okay. But, yeah, I'm uh, sure my wife will, yeah. I was gonna say, we, I'll, I'll work on it. We've gone long enough without actually talking about food, so we, let's get to the dining, because I, I just think, Jamie, that some of the restaurants here are exceptional. We've talked about the sports bar, you know, with ESPN Club, and there are things from walk-up snack stands to... Very, very high-end dining, and one of the restaurants I think is the finest on property. But let's talk about the casual stuff first. We'll kind of work our way up. Like I said, we talked already about the ESPN Club. One of the other places you can go for a casual meal is the Big River Grill and Brewing Works. I don't know if you have you ever eaten there before. We actually ate there for the first time um, this past trip as well. We were very, very impressed. Um, it's not only a restaurant, but it's also, um, I mean, the, the title, Big River Grill and Brewing Works, um, is indicative of the fact that it's an on-site brewmaster. Uh, they do create their uh, own handcrafted specialty beers there as well. Yeah, and you can actually watch and, and see how beer is brewed, and they have a lot of different micro-brews that you can sample um, if you're a, a beer fan. But in addition to just kind of bar food, they have everything from steaks to pastas to fish, um, a little bit of everything else. They have some very unique kind of things, again, like drunken ribeye and grilled pork chops they have meatloaf they've got a kids menu so you don't have to be 18 to eat here if you want to go there just to dine for lunch or dinner it's actually a really really nice place to go even if you're not all that concerned with the um the beer the, the, beer, <laughs> yeah, the beer itself so um a couple of the other quick service things would be the boardwalk bakery and you're looking for if you're going to epcot in the morning and if you're staying on the boardwalk looking for a, a quick place to grab quote unquote I say breakfast if you want to call sweet cinnamon rolls and croissants and uh, cheesecake breakfast the boardwalk bakery is exceptional <laughs> and we, we did just that um, <laughs> we, we were on the dining plan for the first time um, with this last trip and what we kind of found ourselves doing was using our counter services for lunch and our table services for dinner and with that would you know, use up a lot of the snack credits in the morning. Mm. So I'd be the one to, to kind of make the run down over to the Boardwalk Bakery and pick up exactly what you said, and, and it was a real big hit. Right, and you get your you get your caffeine with your coffee, you get your sugar rush, you're ready to hit Epcot and make it a full day. So, uh, and, I, I like and that it. place is packed. It, it's not real big, um, and the line for the three different times I went was out the door. Yeah, yep. And the other uh, the, it, the other venue that's sort of a sort of slash quick service and unique dining venue is Spoodles. And Spoodles is a Mediterranean, family-friendly, family-style type restaurant that also has a walk-up window. If you want to get something to go, you could actually, you don't have to even go inside and sit down. You can go right to the walk-up window and get stuff to go. But Spoodles is, again, another one of these very unique dining experiences. They have 
uh, a tapas style menu that you can really sort of sample a lot of things from the Mediterranean cuisine. Absolutely, and you know, one thing that may not be the first meal that comes to mind when you're thinking about spools, but we've done it twice already because we love it, it's breakfast. Yep. Um, if you do want to take the time and you're not rushing off to a park in the morning and you're in that area, I highly recommend giving spools a try. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of different types of food. Nothing too crazy. Don't let the fact that we, we call it, they call it Mediterranean style fool you or scare you. Um, you do get some cuisine from places like North Africa and Italy and Spain, but uh, it's not overly spicy. It's not um, too crazy, but it's something you should try. There's, there's flatbread. There's all different kinds of dips. There's pasta and seafood. And yes, I, I've eaten there a number of times for breakfast and, uh, and really, really enjoy it. But the, the signature place to eat on the boardwalk, and honestly, Jamie, what I think is one of, without question, Walt Disney World's finest restaurants, bar none, is the Flying Fish Cafe. I would agree, but I will tell you that I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, <laughs> and until I can either go on a research trip or they get old <laughs> enough, I can't do it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's a little bit more upscale. Um, it's the kind of place that really you, it does have a dress code, so you do need to dress for dinner. You don't need to wear a jacket, but you do need to kind of wear whatever they say, resort casual or whatever it might be. But right. uh, the fish is exceptional. They also have steaks. They also have vegetarian dishes. But the the, the venue itself is beautiful. It kind of gives you that, like we talked about before, that Coney Island roller coaster feel inside, but very very elegantly done. Uh, the food, again, if you are a seafood person, absolutely exceptional. They have this this potato wrapped snapper, which is just to die for. Crab cakes, steaks. I'm getting. I'm. I'm. I'm my mouth is watering as I talk about it. Uh, I ate there uh, a couple of months ago with a couple of friends of mine, and we just yeah. it, the, the food was just exceptional. It's one of those open kitchens where you can see everything being cooked right in front of you and they have a bar if you want to sit down at the bar and kind of look out over the kitchen but uh, definitely a place that you should make an advanced dining reservation for but a, a truly unique experience you want to do one of those special meals I highly recommend Flying Fish no absolutely it, it's definitely on our list and, and I'm trying to just figure out a way to get over there <laughs> leave the kids with, with the grandparents or the friends or just put, a, put Ratatouille on in the room and leave them for a couple hours they'll be fine don't worry the six year old will watch the two year old will be good to go uh, there's a couple other places that I think Bear mentioned that we should talk about, and those are some okay. of the lounges. And again, you don't need to stay at any of these resorts to experience them, but the Boardwalk Inn's Bellevue Lounge is really, really one of those. It's a hidden treasure in and of itself. They've got this huge furniture and all kind of antique radios, a very comfortable place to just sit and relax and have a drink. Again, if you want to go there for breakfast, they do have some light breakfast items in the morning. Uh, nice view of the boardwalk, out of the way, usually not very crowded. Really, really enjoy it there, as well as the Crew Club Lounge at the Yacht Club and Martha's Vineyard over at the Beach Club. Yeah, we've been over to the Crew Cup Lounge before. Um, that's a lot of fun. And, I mean, gosh, we, we could probably start listing some of the restaurants on the other side of the lake as well now that I'm taking us over there. But, <laughs> uh, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot of good spots on property, you know, whether you want to escape um, you talk about the Bellevue Lounge, and it is a nice kind of quiet spot away from everything, and um, you know, just a uh, very, very unique experience. All right, and finally, you have some shopping that's there, and you do have, of course, traditional character stores that have housewares and clothes and things like that. That's the Boardwalk Character Carnival. You also have, like I mentioned before, the ESPN Club Store, which is called The Yard. The Yard, the, yeah. The Screen Door General Store gives you a chance to kind of go and pick up some light groceries. You can also pick up snacks and, and uh, you know, water and drinks and things like that. You can bring back to your room souvenirs, whatnot. Um, there's a beachwear shop called Thimbles and Threads. <laughs> Say this three times fast. Thimbles and Threads. And again, these are all sort of one big store all put together. But the very unique store there, again, for most of us, just a, a store to browse through, is the Wyland Galleries. And if you know Wyland's art, he does a lot of uh, very beautiful oceanographic artwork and sculptures. And uh, even if you want to just go in there and browse and see some of the work, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree. Um, and it's funny because when you're home, you're not necessarily thinking of, you know, the pieces of art or, uh, or sculptures that you might want. But when you go in a store like this, you're looking and you think about how great that would look, you know, hanging over the mantle. <laughs> um, 
you know, or something that you know might just fit well into the decor of your home. It's it's absolutely beautiful, and um, it is something that we check out each time we go there too. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and it, it it's not sort of on the pro the, the promenade proper. You have to walk as if you were going up the stairs into the boardwalk or, or back to where the parking is because it's off to the side. But um, there, there's sort of a little park-like area there right in the middle, and it's off to the side there across from the Flying Fish. Definitely should go and check it out, even if you're just walking by. Um, yeah, the, the best way to probably explain it, particularly if you're getting over to the boardwalk by the, the boat ride, is to come up that, that plank and if you just head straight across, you're in that park area that you're speaking of, and then it's just directly on the right-hand side. Exactly. Exactly. So just kind of maybe wrapping things up, Jamie, what do you what do you think are some of the best times to go or the best ways to take advantage of all that the boardwalk has to offer? Especially if maybe if you're, if you're not staying on the boardwalk or you want to come over and, and just experience some of the things we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I think probably the best place to start is going back to the location of itself and the proximity to uh, the two parks that we talked about. If you're spending a day at Epcot and you want a break in the action, whether it's you know to find a place to go and have dinner, and we've already mentioned a number of places, and then maybe head back into Epcot for Illuminations. Um, if you're planning to go to Illuminations and you've been hopping amongst different parks and going to end your day at Epcot, then it makes a lot of sense to go to Boardwalk first. If you're at the Disney Studios, maybe during the day and you're not planning to stay for Fantasmic, you can come uh, over to Boardwalk either, again, by walking or taking the boat, spending the night there. Or similarly, if you're planning on hopping over to uh, the studios to see Fantasmic at the end of the day, go from Boardwalk. Um, Animal Kingdom, a lot of people talk about Animal Kingdom not being an all-day park. But, I mean, even if it is, you're typically going to be wrapping up your day somewhere between probably 4 and 4.30. Consider going over to Boardwalk for the night. Um, if you're going to have a water park day and you go early to mid-morning and you wrap that up by 3 or 4 o'clock after you get cleaned up, consider going over to Boardwalk, uh, you know, have dinner, watch the game at ESPN, or go over to Jelly Rolls or Atlantic Dance for the night. I mean, those would be the things that I would look at. Yeah, th- those are all great tips. And the beauty of the boardwalk and and part of the reason why it's such a hidden treasure is there's something there for everybody you can go there as a family you can take your kids there and there's lots to do there's a lot if you want to just walk on the promenade at night the kids can interact with all the different entertainers you can take them to espn you can take them to some of the different places to eat on the other hand if you want to go as a couple and spend a night out together walk along the promenade if you want to rent a bike if you want to rent a boat have a, a nice dinner at Flying Fish and then go have a drink somewhere else in one of the other lounges or one of the other bars. If you want to go as a bunch of friends and just have a night kind of bouncing around from ESPN to the Atlantic Dance Hall, maybe ending your night over at Jelly Rolls, there's so much to do there. Uh, and again, even if you don't want to go into any of these places, you don't need to spend a dime. If you just want to walk around and enjoy the promenade, uh, spend the night just kind of enjoying the, the views and the vistas. So uh, I think for all these reasons and, and so many more, it definitely qualifies. Jamie, I want to thank you for suggesting it. I want to thank you for coming on, helping me kind of go through it with this um, for everybody. Absolutely. Uh, again, thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Well, hello there, WDW Radio Show listeners. It is Eric Hollister from Geomouse.com, and it is update time for challenge number 10. We want to thank Mike Scoper from MousePlanet.com and WDW Today for his help in the previous challenge. Also want to thank everyone for submitting their answers and those creative mile markers over the last couple weeks. For those of you wondering where Stop the Movie came from, there were many Muppet Vision 3D uh, quotes thrown in there, but... He got a little bit tricky on us. The quote, stop the movie, actually came from the new version of the O Canada film in Epcot's World Showcase. So those of you who got O Canada, congratulations. We went ahead and pulled all of you together. And the winner for mile marker number 10 is Brian Patterson. And he has chosen to name mile marker number 10 as if you can dream it, you can do it. 
for at least 3.1 more miles. And congratulations to Brian, he will receive both Walt Disney World Trivia Books Volumes 1 and 2 signed by Lou Mangiello, a DisneyWorldTrivia.com t-shirt, as well as a trading pin and lanyard from DisneyWorldTrivia.com. He also gets the Walt Disney Treasures, your host, Walt Disney, on DVD, the unofficial guide to Walt Disney World for 2008, ding. And of course, your name will also be thrown into the grand prize drawing, which will take place at the end of the marathon in January. And finally, you will also receive a certificate of dedication for mile marker number 10, which again is if you can dream it, you can do it for at least 3.1 more miles. And geomouse.com will donate $100 to the Dream Team Project. So, folks, we're going to send it back to Lou right now. Stay tuned as another member from WDW Today will be on to help us out with challenge number 11. So stay tuned later in the episode. We're going to send it back to Lou Mangiello and the WDW Radio Show. I've spoken in the past about the DisneyWorldTrivia.com Dream Team Project to help send children with life-threatening illnesses to Walt Disney World through the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. What started with me taking portions of the proceeds of book sales three years ago has blossomed into an ongoing fundraising mission thanks to the help of incredible volunteers and people who have donated their time and money and even in Disney merchandise to our annual charity auction at Magic Meets. Last year, we raised $9,000 in just a few hours, and I'm still overwhelmed by the efforts and actions of so many people. We set up a donations page at firstgiving.com and have raised almost $14,000 so far. And that number doesn't even include the three children that we sent to Walt Disney World in the past through our previous efforts with the Starlight Starbright Foundation. But recently, I've been contacted by people like Eric Hollister from geomouse.com, who's not only purchased some amazing Disney prizes for our 13-part Walt Disney World Half Marathon Challenge Contest, but also continues to donate $100 for each winner of the 13 challenges. Well, last week, quite unexpectedly, I received an email from a listener named David Petter from Texas who wanted to do his part to help. He said, Since it's a season of giving, I'd like to present an idea that I thought would benefit your listeners and your charity. I have a collection of Walt Disney World memorabilia that I've amassed from visiting every year since I was two years old, as well as my time working in the parks on the Disney College program. Well, what David proposed is something that we're calling the 25 Days of Disney Giving. Starting on December 1st, he's going to post a new Disney item on eBay every day for 25 days. Items range from 15-year anniversary signs and bicentennial license plates to pre-opening postcards and electrical water pageant LPs, cast member exclusives, Euro Disney items, and even signed castle sculptures. He thought it was fitting to have a 25th anniversary item to kick off the 25 days, so the first auction, Sundays, is going to be a 10-day item, and then each item after that is going to be a 5-day auction. Now, after all the various eBay listing fees have been paid, he's going to donate 50% of all the proceeds to the DisneyWorldTrivia.com Dream Team Project. And every day there's going to be something new for these 25 days, so it's going to kind of be like an advent calendar to count down to Christmas. And he hopes that you're going to be inspired to give this holiday season as well as win something new for your collection. So I want to thank David and everyone who looks, bids, and wins some of these great items. Please help spread the word about this auction elsewhere, as it's not just a great way to add some wonderful pieces to your collection, but an opportunity to help children that really do need some of that Disney magic in their lives. I'm going to put a link up in this week's show notes page. I'm also going to put links up in the forums over at DisneyWorldTrivia.com, where you can find out more about the auctions and go ahead and place your bids. Again, my thanks to David for his donations, as well as thanks to you for looking, bidding, and possibly winning one of these great items. Howdy, folks. Please keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the train and remain seated at all times. Now then, hang on to them hats and glasses, because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. (laughs) 
When we talk about some of the notable names in Disney Imagineering, so many come to mind, and each possesses a wide variety of talents and contributions to the parks and resorts. And today, a new generation of Imagineers continues in this storied tradition and carries on that legacy that wasn't started by a mouse, but by Walt Disney himself. And my next guest is just one of those Imagineers. From a college program Jungle Cruise skipper to working on updating revered attractions like Pirates of the Caribbean and, more recently, the Haunted Mansion in Walt Disney World, he worked his way up through Imagineering to be one of its true creative forces. But beyond his work in the parks, he's a celebrated author, having written a definitive resource materials for each of those attractions, not to mention Madame Leota's epitaph, as well as other books on Imagineering itself. So he is, of course, Jason Sorrell, and his latest book is all about Imagineering at its peak as he covers the Disney mountains around the world. So I want to welcome him to the WDW radio show. Thank you, Lou. It's a pleasure to be here. Jason, thanks very much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. And I wanted to talk to you because I really enjoyed, personally, your new book, because it takes a, a very, very in-depth look at everything from the imagination to the planning and engineering and everything that goes into creating one of these e-ticket attractions. And you start with the Matterhorn, you go through the mountains around the world, as well as some of the concepts that never really made it off of the drawing board. And, and the book's real appeal, I think, is not only that it appeals to geeks like me, but as well uh, the, gash, the casual guest as well, because you have so many stories and histories and everything else. Where did the idea for this book come from? Was it a personal project or something that just seemed logical, maybe in the wake of the popularity of Everest? Well, if I remember correctly, Lou, uh, I pitched the idea for a book on the Disney Mountains around the same time as the Haunted Mansion and Pirates books. Um, I Actually, I think the Haunted Mansion was already under my belt, and I was looking at other areas of, of interest that, you know, of Disney subjects that I think could support a book. And the mountains came to mind immediately because everyone has a favorite Disney mountain attraction of, of one sort or another. So to me, it seemed like a logical subject for a book. And, and the great thing about it was, again, with Everest on the horizon, no pun intended, um, I saw that there was a logical beginning and end of this journey, if you will, a, a journey that began with the Matterhorn bobsleds in 1959 and culminated with the opening of Expedition Everest in 2006. And the interesting thing is that with each subsequent Disney mountain, we took a quantum leap forward in the art of Imagineering in one form or another, whether it was the world's first tubular steel roller coaster like the Matterhorn or the world's first computer-controlled ride system like Space Mountain or uh, a mountain that was designed to tell a story, a, a very specific story, in addition to providing thrills like Big Thunder Mountain and Splash Mountain, and it all finally culminated with Expedition Everest, which really... I think, drew on everything we had learned over the course of 50 years of Imagineering and put it all together in one unbelievable attraction. Well, that's the thing. You, know, you made reference to trying to put it all together. There was so much to cover in for all these different mountains in a relatively small amount of space. I mean, the book's 128 pages. It's a very big book. But how hard was it to maybe trim down what was undoubtedly pardon the pun, a mountain of information and materials of 50-plus years of Imagineering. I have no idea. I probably wrote three or four times as much as what appears in the book. But, you know, we only have so much real estate, as they, as they say in New York, <laughs> in order to cover these subjects. So, unfortunately, a lot fell by the wayside. But I think we distilled the story down, you know, to its essence, regard, regardless of which attraction we were talking about. But you know, there is just so much detail, and that's really what made it uh, a monumental project, because with, with something like the Haunted Mansion or Pirates of the Caribbean, you're only dealing with one attraction, even when you take into account its various incarnations in Magic Kingdoms around the world, at the end of the day, you're still only talking about one attraction. But with the mountains, you are talking about multiple attractions that take different forms around the world. So my job kind of multiplied exponentially in terms of what to cover. So I started to, to winnow down the subject matter a little bit by focusing on the mountain that best, or the version of the attraction that best exemplified 
each mountain. You know, for example, Space Mountain is predominantly a Walt Disney World story. Uh, Big Thunder Mountain, also predominantly a Walt Disney World story, even though it premiered at Disneyland first. Matterhorn Bobsleds is exclusively a Disneyland story. So I tried to start with the park upon which that mountain had the biggest impact, and then filled in the details around it from there in terms of the differences between the attractions around the world and in various parks. And that's the thing. I mean, so many of these attractions in and of themselves could almost justify a book on their own and probably had enough history to it to justify a, a book. Uh, and again, you, you made reference to the fact that you not only cover the mountains in Walt Disney World and Disneyland, but all the mountains worldwide. How long do, you know, approximately did it take you to, to put it together from beginning to end? Uh, this whole book, in terms of, of when I started outlining and writing to the book coming out, was uh, at least a year and a half, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and I think I pitched it a year or two before that. So it, it depends on, on how much you want, how big you want the total to be. But in terms of actual writing, researching, and rewriting, you're looking at about a year and a half for this one, as opposed to roughly nine months for The Haunted Mansion and, uh, and Pirates. Uh, th- so those were both like having children. This, this was like having, you know, quintuplets. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other things I really enjoyed about the book, too, was you also talked about some of the lost concepts, like Disneyland's Candy Mountain and what I believe is a true lost treasure in Mark Davis's Thunder Mesa, which was originally destined for Walt Disney World. What, was it difficult to find information on these? And, and tell me about that process. A Western River Expedition, it was not hard at all because that attraction was very well documented and it was, there was also a lot of development work done on it. I mean, we all, we all know that it was a, a, an absolutely gorgeous scale model was done of that attraction, so there were plenty of photos of all of the, the maquettes and show scenes that were mocked up for the model. Mark produced a, a voluminous amount of artwork for, for Western, River, Western River Expedition. I went over it with, with uh, Alice, you know, Mark's, uh, Mark's wife. And uh, you you could hear in her voice the passion Mark had for that attraction. And I think that was an example of Mark really trying to get Imagineering to top itself and out pirate, Pirates of the Caribbean, if you will. So that was very well documented. Unfortunately, that was one of the subjects that uh, had to be trimmed down just in order to tell the Big Thunder story. But, you know, you at least get a good sense of how it all came about and, and what Mark was trying to do. Candy Mountain is also a very fun story. There's not nearly as much material uh, to fall back on on that, but the the joy of that of telling that story was just hearing Harriet Burns talk about the creation of building the scale model. Uh, that was back when the Wed Model Shop was still um, in an old tin shed <laughs> on the studio lot in Burbank, and they used real candy in order to make this model. So after a while in, in, in the hot Southern California sun, it just got to be a gooey mess. And ultimately, Walt brought John Hench, you know, legendary Imagineer, and really the, the one person, I think, who shaped the, the art of Imagineering more than anybody, as Marty Sklar will tell you. Uh, he brought John down to take a look at it to kind of get his take and, and pass final judgment. And John took one look at it and said, well, you know, Candy and sweets are great if you're talking about dessert. You know, you've had an appetizer, a salad, the main course. So a little bit of sweets is, works really well as a dessert. But with this attraction, you've got nothing but dessert. It's just a big mountain of sweets, and I think it's too much. And Walt just looked at him, looked at the model, and said, Johnny, you're absolutely right. We're, we're killing it. <laughs> and, and he just walked back out into the sunshine. And Harriet Burns said, you know, uh, she and and uh, and uh, everyone else, you know, Fred Jurger, everyone in the model shop, kind of looked at it and went, "Okay, you know, one one quick walk down here after lunch, and Walt kills something that we worked six <laughs> months on." And you know, she says it with a with a laugh and a smile in her voice, but it was just hysterical because you knew that it had to just be a nightmare dealing with these little peppermint sticks and lemon drops and chocolate and whatever it was they they used to build this model. And you know. Walt takes one look at it with John Henge, and, and there it goes, lost to history. It. But a, a fun story, and, and some great artwork still exists from it. Well, it's that artwork that kind of brings me to my next question, because the book, as I said, is just beautiful, and so much of the concept art that we get to see in here is spectacular. And it's great that we as fans get to see some of these true treasures that really have been hidden from view for decades. Well, that's that's really the reason I started doing the books in the first place, uh, because people ask, well, you know, what motivated this? You know, how did you get the idea? And it's simply because 
I grew up loving Disney books and collecting Disney books. So, you know, going back to the Haunted Mansion and Pirates books, these were simply books that I wanted to read, but they didn't exist. So my only alternative was to go ahead and write them. And, uh, and that was, that's always been a pleasure, too, for some of the very reasons, you know, we've been talking about. You know, I get to spend time with Harriet Burns and Blaine Gibson and Exitensio and Alice Davis and Tony Baxter and... You know, really, I mean, especially for an Imagineer like me, that's a way to better learn my own art, you know, and my own approach to Imagineering is by spending time with these people and, and, and hearing these stories and, and, and learning from them. And that's really the, the joy of doing the books. But it all boils down to, you know, one fan wanting them on his shelf. And, you know, that's why I do it. Yeah, and one of the things about this book and all the books that you've, you've written – is that you have the opportunity to have these first-hand interviews and stories as told by these Imagineers themselves, and you mentioned so many of these names, and it's a who's who of legendary Disney Imagineering. I mean, Marty Sklar wrote your foreword, as well as Tony Baxter, uh, George McGinnis, Tom Fitzgerald, Mary Blair, ex- I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You got to speak to these people one-on-one, get to explore the genesis of these attractions from concept to opening. Uh, And the other thing that I liked about the book, too, is we got to see photos of these Imagineers at work. You know, there's pictures of a very young uh, Tony Baxter working on Big Thunder Mountain and and just so many that are just excellent. And that was probably the the pleasure of this book. Uh, You you mentioned the who's who and, and how it spanned the generations. And that was really, I think, um, if you read in between the lines, kind of a hidden through line, because with the mountains in particular, you can really see a passing of the torch, you know, from the first generation of Imagineers, the, the men and women that Walt himself hired, to a second generation, people like Tom Fitzgerald, Tony Baxter, Chris Teets, who are in turn mentoring a third generation, of which I'm happy to be a part. And you can really see how the art of Imagineering is literally handed down from one generation to the next. And, and I don't think that's more clear than it is with with the mountain attractions and especially with with uh some of the stories i got to hear i mean marty's story about the initial presentation to the rca executives in new york is priceless and he tells it in his own voice in his foreword you know one of the first things tom fitzgerald wrote when he became an imagineer was the infamous safety spiel for big thunder mountain you know howdy folks please keep your hands and arms inside the train you know that's tom fitzgerald and you know, Tony Baxter, having worked on Big Thunder Mountain and Splash Mountain, you know, he was the perfect person to write the afterwards. So it was really a thrill to get to sit with these guys and hear some of these stories firsthand, many of whom, many of which I had never heard before. And uh, you're hearing them from the guys that, that built these mountains. Well, one of the consistency that not only runs through, you know, uh, Imagineering, but that runs through all the mountains themselves was the fact that they face such unique challenges in conceptualizing to designing to engineering them but again this is what you as imagineers excel at is facing these challenges head on overcoming them and finding such creative ways to do that well that's and that goes all the way back to the beginning because like i like to think that imagineering is in the insanity business imagineering is in the impossible business and that is something that walt started literally in the latter part of the 1950s by going to his imagineers you know, showing them a picture of the Matterhorn and saying, essentially, build this. And, you know, Harriet Burns is, you know, hysterical when she says, at that point, we literally thought the old man had lost his mind. You know, because even for the Imagineers who by that point had opened Disneyland, so they had already, you know, built a a fairy tale uh, castle and a jungle in the middle of of the Southern California desert. But when Walt came and said, I want to create a snow-capped mountain with a toboggan ride. Even they thought he had lost his mind. So I, I think it, it just demonstrates that the mountains, better than anything else, exemplify what Walt Disney Imagineering does best, and that is literally the impossible. Yeah, and one of the things that I liked seeing in the books, and that, that's always amazed me about how these things come to, to pass, is that the, amount, the, the level of detail that since like you said, from Walt's day, from day one, has gone into the, not only the artwork, but the building of representative scale models down to the use of textures and colors and even rocks and plants. And that continues to to kind of permeate through any attraction that that is built today. Yeah. And, you know, for that, look no further than Joe Rohde, who took a team to Nepal and, and, and the Far East, you know, to really research 
the culture and the landscape behind an expedition Everest so that when you come to Disney's Animal Kingdom, I mean, I know I'm never going to make it to the real Mount Everest, so the, 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 uh, the miniature version we have here is as close as I'm going to get, but thanks to Joe Rohde and his team and the detail with which they infuse their work, you really are having an authentic experience. And I think that is, that's one of the hallmarks of Imagineering is the, the sheer attention to detail. And again, I, I keep coming back to Harriet Burns, but she tells a funny story about that too. She's like, well, when we built the Matterhorn, all we had was a National Geographic and a couple of postcards. <laughs> so it, you know, there again, you see the, the evolution and the journey that we made from the Matterhorn in 1959 to Expedition Everest in 2006. Well, central to all these, these these mountains from 59 and to all the attractions, really, is the use of story. And that, that actually brings me right to Everest, because I think Everest is, is undoubtedly Imagineering at its best. It really takes not only the attraction, but the use of story to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we don't build roller coasters. Anyone can throw up a rickety wooden roller coaster or, you know, a steel coaster, we don't do that at, at Walt Disney Imagineering. We tell stories, and, and that's something that Walt started with, with the Matterhorn bobsleds. You know, he did not want to build a typical amusement park roller coaster. He wanted to, to recreate the experience of bobsledding down, you know, to, to, to quote the spiel, the icy slopes of the majestic Matterhorn. So from the very beginning, he was telling stories in these quote-unquote thrill rides, and that continued with Space Mountain. It certainly continued with Big Thunder Mountain. You know, Tony Baxter made, made a very big point about how he wanted it to look as though man had built a railroad uh, around this existing rugged western landscape and not the other way around. You know, like, well, we threw up a roller coaster track and then built a mountain around it. He wanted to create that authentic experience for guests. Splash Mountain is a very good example where you actually get to hear and experience a fully fleshed out three act story of Br'er Rabbit. You know, but you get to experience it for for yourself. You you're there when he gets the call to adventure. You're there when he strikes out and gets into trouble with Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear, and you're with him as he gets flung into the briar patch and returns home to discover that there's no place like home. I mean, it's a fully formed three-act story. And then with Expedition Everest, which is probably one of the greatest thrill experiences that Imagineering has ever created, you know, you're not just going on a roller coaster. You're trekking into the Himalayas for an encounter with the Yeti. And that attraction, I think, more than any of the others we've done, is just infused with story and infused with detail. And that's all because, you know, just building a roller coaster or a thrill ride isn't good enough for us. And that's the thing about Everest, you know, beyond it being a marvel of engineering by intertwining all these structures inside and outside the mountain, um, the the fact that the story begins not when you get into the queue, but far outside the actual attraction. This is why I try and tell people to spend the time as they trek through Asia and really feel the entire experience of Everest. And don't go through the fast pass line. Take the time and go through standby because there's so much detail, so much story to experience there that you could really get so much more out of it than just the thrill of the attraction itself. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Everest story spreads out not only into Asia as a land, you know, as you say, as you're approaching, as you're leaving Anandapur and, and approaching, you know, these, uh, this outlying village with, with uh, the Forbidden Mountain and, and Everest in the distance, but it also, I think, serves as a backdrop for any number of areas in the park. In fact, it's, it's almost become Walt Disney World's Matterhorn. You know, uh, anyone growing up in Southern California would, would always, you know, they couldn't wait for that first glimpse of the, the snow-capped peak of the Matterhorn as they're coming down the 5 freeway. I think Expedition Everest does the same thing for, for visitors who are approaching Animal Kingdom, you know, by car, by motor coach, or however they're getting there. You know, you're just excited for that first glimpse of it hovering above the trees. And I, I think that's all part of it. It creates, you know, that, that story begins long before you even enter the park. Right. And I think, you know, speaking about the Matterhorn, you know, the Yeti itself is just so remarkable in Expedition Everest. But if you think back to the abominable snowman that was added to the Matterhorn in 77, that really was a hint of things to come. And the Everest kind of shows us how we've con, kind of gone full circle and how the technology has progressed really exponentially. 
Yeah, it's funny. In the book, I, I make some kind of, I, one of my headings, I think, is The Return of the Abominable Snowman. It's, it's interesting that, that that character made kind of an encore appearance, if you will, in a different form uh, in another attraction. That, that's one of the reasons I love considering the Matterhorn and Expedition Everest as these great bookends for the Imagineering story. You know, when, when you just, when you think of the, uh, the advances that, that, uh, that Walt and his team made with the Matterhorn and how, you know, the Imagineering teams made them steadily, every subsequent attraction that they did kind of culminating with Expedition Everest, you know, these two mountains really do form natural bookends to the, to the Disney Mountain story. And, um, you know, Joe Rohde and his team spent so much time in the Far East and they really got to know the people of that part of the world. And, you know, the Yeti is a good example of that because to, to them, as, especially some of the folks in these remote villages, I mean, the, for them, the Yeti is a fact of life. So in the design of the Yeti, they tried to create a real world approximation of a, of a mythical creature. So it's much more reality-based in its fantasy than the Abominable Snowman was. The Abominable Snowman was just that, kind of this almost fantasy-type character that, that you encounter as you go through the icy caverns of the Matterhorn, whereas the Yeti is really much more of a reflection of that part of the world and the people who live there and what they may believe. And that's, that's part of the reason that uh, Joe and his team devoted so much time and energy and space to the Yeti Museum that you experience as you go through the queue. We're really telling a cultural story, a culturally significant story in that attraction, and I think the Yeti is a, is a prime example of that and how he is depicted and portrayed in that story. Well, the, the authenticity is unmatched, I think, anywhere, because you talked about how Harriet Burns' reference materials were so sparse, you know, using a National Geographic and the pictures, whereas here, even though you see in the book your, your pictures of the different Imagineers and artists kind of uh, coming up with their own concepts of the Yeti, more so than the Matterhorn, it was important to get people who have experienced it and believe it, what they feel the Yeti looks like, and, and that infusion of the culture is just it permeates the entire attraction and the the entire land uh, I think better than than can be seen anywhere else in the parks. Yeah, in fact, you know, you mentioned the the Yeti and people's interpretations of the Yeti. Uh, Joe talked to a, a, any number of people who would very matter of factly talk about having seen the Yeti, and they you know a lot of that description wound up going into the creative process and our ultimate depiction of the character. But you know, the the Yeti that you encounter on Expedition Everest could very well exist somewhere. I mean, and, and again, that's a testament to that level of detail. Stuart Samita was consulted uh, in terms of how to represent the Yeti as a biological creature. You know, so it wasn't just like, you know, oh, we need to, to you know, create a president or a movie star or a ghost or a pirate. I mean, we really, the, the, that team went to great lengths to create the Yeti as a fully functioning biological being. You know, I mean, they took it that seriously. And knowing how important the, the Yeti figure is to that part of the world and, and, and that culture, it, it was something that they really wanted to, to get right. Well, you as can, right as you can for a mythical creature anyway. Right, but you can see the, the time and the research that the Imagineers put into going so far as to travel thousands of miles overseas to such exotic locales. And, and that actually maybe brings me to a question for you, Jason, because we talk about the research that they put into uh, Everest. What about your research for this book? Did you have to take some of those horrible trips overseas to Hong Kong and Tokyo and Paris to, to, to write the book? Luckily, I did not have to go to Mount Everest. Uh, I don't think I would have made it. <laughs> the, uh, the the joy of doing the research for these books um, not primarily lies in being able to sit down with the legendary Imagineers and hearing these stories firsthand. I mean, to be able to sit in Harriet Burns's family room with Harriet and Blaine Gibson and spend hours with them, you know, talking about attractions that you grew up with, and then you know, getting to drive into Santa Barbara for for a quiet dinner with the two of them is is pretty much priceless. Um, but even beyond that, getting to go to the, the the Imagineering Art Library and the archives on the studio lot, and getting to dig through files and and old memos from to and from Walt Disney himself, I, I mean that is just unbelievable to me and. It's really one of the joys of getting to do these things. It's it's the research and the interviewing and the, you know the life experience that you get to have. And and I hope that I'm able to 
you know, give a, a, a feel of what that's like in the book itself, you know, to, to readers so that, so that they can feel what it's like to, to sit down with, with the Harriet Burns or to plow through the archives. That, that's exactly what I was going to say, because you really can tell, you're, you, you very well convey these stories, not that being told by you, but being told by the people that really experienced them so many years ago, and, and that comes through very, very clearly throughout the book. Well, that, you know, in Walt Disney Imagineering and the Disney parks are, are part of our cultural history. They're part of American history and now part of world history. And I, I, I think that it's important to capture these stories and preserve them because, you know, I know that these attractions and these people inspired me to do what I want, to do what I do for a living. So I hope that in, in helping these people tell their stories, that, you know, kids growing up today, growing up with Expedition Everest, like I grew up with Big Thunder Mountain and the Matterhorn, might be inspired to follow their dreams and, and go, in, go into Imagineering themselves. Or more to the point, you know, become a biologist if they're inspired by the Yeti, or uh, become an astronaut if they're inspired by Space Mountain. We've all heard stories of that kind. I mean, Sally Ride, the famous female astronauts, you know, described being on the space shuttle as, as being on an e-ticket at Disneyland. I don't, I don't think it gets more clear than that. Absolutely. And clearly, you're, you're very passionate about all the Disney mountains, uh, you know, just the way you, you speak about Everest. But you also called Mount Prometheus the jewel of Tokyo Disney Sea. Do you have any personal favorites of the mountains as an Imagineer? And maybe do you have a different favorite as a guest that just likes riding the attractions? Well, as an Imagineer, it's, it's hard to compete with Everest because, as we've said, it simply represents Imagineering at its peak and the culmination of everything that we've learned over 50 years. But honestly, as, as a guest, I think there's something that I love about every single ride I take on any one of the mountains. I, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for the Matterhorn because it was that beacon, you know, that you saw from the five freeway and you could not wait to get into Disneyland. You could not wait to get on it. And, uh, by the first time I had experienced it, the abominable snowman was always, was already part of it. So hearing his roar as you were coming down main street into central plaza, th there's just something about the Matterhorn that is just sheer magic for me. And then with big thunder, uh, I remember when I was growing up, I almost, you know, it's a runaway mine train, but I remember regardless of where I was sitting in the train, looking at the engine and just, you know, pulling us and just feeling that it had a personality, a mind of its own, almost like a Herbie the love bug of the old West. And just thinking, wow, this is out of control. This train is just crazy. You know, and I, I think that's part of the fun is that you're on this, you know, out of control runaway mine train. And then space mountain, of course, especially growing up as part of the star Wars generation, you know, that really captured my imagination as well. So when I rode Space Mountain, I was captain of the Millennium Falcon. I was blasting off on my own, you know, wild ride through outer space. So I think each one of the mountains taps into a different part of a, a, a kid's imagination, no matter how old that kid is. And, and I think that's what the Disney parks do best. They, they help you tell and experience your own stories in which you're the star. Well, you, you hit on a key word th there, too, and that's fun. And that's exactly what the book is. Uh, it's a quick read, but it's very, very interesting. You don't have to read it from cover to cover. You can pick it up and use it either as a reference manual or just uh, something to enjoy. I, I think it, it's it's very well written and, it, like I said, absolutely beautiful to look at. Uh, can, can I ask what might be on the horizon for you, whether it be maybe in the way of more books or, or projects for the parks? Yes, the, the next book is called The Creative Force, From Star Tours to Indiana Jones Adventure. And as you can imagine, uh, that's about the longtime collaboration that Imagineering has had with George Lucas and uh, some of the attractions and live shows that have resulted from that collaboration, uh, primarily focusing on Star Tours and Indiana Jones Adventure. But, you know, it'll cover everything that we've worked on with George, in including the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular and, uh, and you know, some of the other versions of, of those attractions like Indiana Jones Adventure at Tokyo Disney Sea. So it'll turn the spotlight on our collaboration with George Lucas and everything that's come out of that. You know, you just put a really big smile on the faces of thousands of, of geeks out there that really enjoy not only the Disney parks, but uh, their, their collaboration with Lucas, myself included. So, uh, Well, I put a big smile on my own face because you know, we've been talking about you know, who you get to interview and spend time with, so... When you consider the subject matter, it would only make sense, Lou, that I would sit down with, say, 
George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Harrison Ford. <laughs> For somebody who grew up in the 70s and 80s, I, I'm just about out of my mind with excitement about tackling this project. So Joe Rohde gets to sit on a freezing cold mountain in Nepal somewhere while you get to go to Skywalker Ranch. It all it all balances out. So. <laughs> Joe can go wherever in the world he wants. If I get to go to Skywalker Ranch and and meet Indiana Jones in person, uh, I, I can check out at any time after that. Thank you. I can imagine. <laughs> and when is that book slated to come out? Uh, we're we're not sure yet. Um, it, we, we, this is another monumental one, as you can imagine. And I'm only just getting into the to the research, and uh, hopefully we'll start the interviews next year. So uh, stay tuned on that one. But it'll it'll definitely be a, a couple few years. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jason, much like each of the Imagineers that that you talk about in the book, you are talented on so many levels, not only with what you've done here with the Disney Mountains book and your wildly successful Mansion and Pirates book, which I really believe are the the de facto resources for information about those attractions, but you are also a show writer and director and concept developer and so much more, and your work uh, and contributions continue to be enjoyed by guests around the world. Uh, not to, not the least of which was your amazing work on the recent Haunted Mansion refurb at Walt Disney World. Uh, I, I can tell you uh, how incredibly impressed I and I know everybody else was with that. And your passion for what you do really shines through uh, in everything you do, including your latest book, which is The Disney Mountains Imagineering at its Peak. Um, like I said, you are part of a very elite group that really creates magic. And you continue to ca- carry on that tradition that I talked about in a way that I'm sure Walt would continue to be proud of. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure, Lou. And I'm going to put a link up in the show notes. The book is available in bookstores as well as Amazon.com. If you're interested in purchasing the book, like I said, I'll put a link up this week. Jason, hopefully you can come back again in the future. We could talk about some of your other work and experiences at Imagineering. That'd be great. I look forward to it. We're getting close to the finish line for the Walt Disney World Half Marathon Challenge Contest, and I want to once again welcome back Eric Hollister from Geomouse.com to the show. Hey there, Lou. Eric, welcome. And like I said, this this whole contest was your idea, and you've been just so incredibly generous each week with not only donating the prizes and the certificates to the winners, but $100 every week for the marathon challenges to the DisneyWorldTrivia.com Dream Team Project as well. So I just wanted to just take a second to say thank you again, not only for the contributions, but for all the time and, and the work that you continue to put into this. Well, and that, thank you, Lewis. <laughs> now, look, this week, Eric, we, we have another very, very special guest joining us to present oh, the next... Oh, you mean next... that was somebody else clapping? Okay. <laughs> no, that wasn't me clapping for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he he really is a, a good friend of mine and of the shows, and he is a fellow podcaster and webmaster, and I think really a true asset to the Disney community. He is the brains behind the WDW Today podcast, and really the glue that holds that show together. So it's an honor to have him on the show. I want to introduce you to my friend and all-around nice guy, Len Testa. <laughs> I was one. <laughs> <laughs> Insert crickets here. Uh, of course, I'm talking about none other than Matt Hotchberg and some of those things hold true for you as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I was ready to compliment you, like, oh, he he sunk me before I could, you know, bring out the jokes. But, uh, <laughs> gee, now now you're just setting me up for them. But uh, I, I'm glad to be on such a short segment uh, once more on this show, which would be the opposite of the rest of the show, because I'm sure this is what hour number five we're in right now. <laughs> Listen, you were the man that came on to talk about Hollywood Boulevard and talk for 55 minutes, so you, you lose all credibility when you talk about show length. So. As, as I've told Deanna many times, it takes two to tango, baby. <laughs> what do you guys, let's get serious, what do you guys have planned for, for this week's challenge? 
Well, uh, I had an idea. Um, I had come on before to help Eric and, and you out, Lou, with the challenge. And previously we had, I picked a picture somewhere in the studios and uh, your listeners had to guess where it is. And this time I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to uh, instead offer some trivia. And this trivia actually can be found at Sid Kawanga's uh, One of a Kind store, which is over on Hollywood Boulevard. And if you've never had an opportunity to really stop in here and take a look, they offer trivia. It changes on a weekly basis, and it's general movie trivia. Some of it is slanted towards Disney, but it's general, really, uh, movie trivia here. And uh, what, what's great about it is that you as the guest can, if you know all five questions correctly, you can ask the cast member to answer them. And if you get them all correct, you get a certificate of completion. It's a magical moment, technically. You get to sign uh, your name in this uh, great little uh, guest book over there. And they give you a certificate. So it's really fantastic. I definitely recommend trying out. So I thought for this week I would offer up some of these questions uh, over here to our listeners to try out. And uh, just, you know, some most of them are, are I think, you either know it or you don't. And uh, so although a lot of these are easily Googleable, I think because your listeners, Lou, are of such high uh, caliber and um, and high standing – not unlike certain other listeners that happen to frequent other podcasts, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure they would never resort to such uh, petty resources like cheating. Well, then I'll go ahead and, uh, and read off the questions. So uh, here we go. Uh, there's five questions, and and the uh, the first question is: Name the most recent actor to say Bond, James Bond. Number two: Name the character in Gone with the Wind who optimistically says, "Tomorrow is another day." Number three, name the film in which Owen Wilson says, Speed, I am speed. Number four, name the actor who shouts, Adrian! I'm sure you can do a better impression than me, Lou. I mean, the whole Jersey thing, (laughs) right next to Philly. (laughs) And number five, name the film in which Tom Hanks says, Mama always said, life's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. All right, there you go. There's your five questions. Eric, why don't you tell them what the prizes are going to be for this week and when the deadline is to get the entries in. All right, please submit all entries to marathon at wdwradio.com. You have up until midnight on December 12th to get in your answers. We will pull all correct submissions together, and the winner will uh, receive both Disney World Trivia Books Volumes 1 and 2 signed by Lou. I am almost finished with this marathon. Thank the world. Mangello. The Disney World tr- Trivia.com t-shirt, a trading pin and lanyard, also courtesy of Disney World Trivia.com. In honor of the most recent Disney release, we're going to also throw in Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End on DVD, as well as the Art of the Pirates of the Caribbean book. Finally, you'll get a certificate of dedication for mile marker number 11. That's right, this one is mile marker number 11. So please submit your mile marker in addition to your entries. Finally, your name will be thrown into the drawing for the grand prize, which will happen after the marathon. And geomouse.com will donate $100 to the Dream Team Project. Back to you, Lou. All right, guys, thank you very much, as always, for coming on. Uh, Matt from StudiosCentral.com and <clears throat> WDWToday.com and Eric Hollister from GeoMouse. Guys, I look forward to seeing you next week at MouseFest. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Woo-hoo and ya is all I can get. <laughs> I got yeah, That was enthusiastic. <laughs> Thank you again for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to give a very special thanks to Imagineer and author Jason Sorrell for coming on the show this week. I'm going to put links up in the show notes at wdwradio.com where you can purchase his new book, Disney Mountains, Imagineering at its Peak, as well as his Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean from the Magic Kingdom to the Movies books. Thanks also to all the listeners who sent in news and rumors this week, as well as Jamie Kersey for his help on the Boardwalk Hidden Treasures, and a very special thanks to David Petter for his 25 days of Disney giving charity auctions on eBay. Again, I'm going to put links up to that in this week's show notes as well. You can find links at wdwradio.com. You can also find links to some of my recommended vacation planning sites and services like orlandofuntickets.com. For the best prices from the largest official and authorized Disney discount ticket provider, they have some specials going on right now that include free upgrades and always with the best possible prices. 
The Magic for Less Travel is my recommended travel provider. They offer exceptional, personalized service and the best possible prices on your next Disney vacation. Their services are completely free to you. You've heard from the owner, Pam Forster, a number of times on the show. She and all of her agents get it, and they have a number of specials and free offers going on as well. Before you go to Disney World, be sure you sign up for your owner's locker. You can store just about anything in your secure locker that owner's locker will deliver to and pick up from your resort, which means less packing, less hassles, less hauling, and yes, less stress. It'll make your vacation much more convenient. You can learn more at ownerslocker.com, where you remember, you can try it free for one year. Quick reminder, my first audio guide to Walt Disney World is now available at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. It is Main Street USA, and it's available on CD for just $9.99. There, you can also still get both trivia books, Volume 1 and 2 combined, for just $20. I'm also still looking for old photos from Walt Disney World, especially from the 70s to the 90s. If you have any that you want to share of shows, shops, attractions, or even just outside in the parks, please send them to Lou, that's L-O-U, at WDWRadio.com. Next week is Mouse Fest, so if you're going to be there, please stop by any one of my four meets. You can find those at mousefest.org, as well as the Mega Mouse Meet on Saturday afternoon, where I will have a table and have books and CDs for sale as well. I'm likely going to be doing some re- uh, recording while there and while I'm down at Mouse Fest, so come on by if you want to be part of the show. I'm really, really looking forward to it this year. It's my fourth time going. I'm looking forward to my meets and the Mega Meet, as well as so many other meets I'll be going to, including some of... Uh, those are my special guests that I've had on the past, like Steve Barrett's Hidden Mickey's Hunt, uh, St- Tim Foster's Guide to the Magic Meets, like his Guide to the Magic Kids Tour of Epcot and Magic Kingdom and World Showcase. Those are Saturday, Sunday, and mon- Monday. There's other great meets like Muppets Meets with Fred Block, the Rock and Roller Coaster Meet with the All About the Mouse Kateer guys, the uh, Holiday Wishes and the Parade during Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party, and so much more. Again, you can find the full schedule at mousefest.org. As always, please keep emailing the show at lou at wdwradio.com with any questions, comments, feedback, or suggestions that you have. And call in your voicemails to 206-202-4WDW. Be sure you stay to the end of the show this week where I play a few more of your, your, your voicemails that came in this week. And remember, you can join us all week long at our fun and very, very friendly forums at disneyworldtrivia.com for discussions about the show and all things Disney. And finally, as always, if you like the show, please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Thanks again to my guests, and thanks, as always, to you for tuning in again this week. Have a great week. See ya. Hi, Lou. It's Catherine from Massachusetts. Just listening to your most recent show, where you talked about possible changes to the fast pass system. Um, I really hope that Disney does not give extra parks to the, um, you know, depending on where you stay. It just, I think that's one of the nice things about Disney, that everybody is treated equal regardless of whether you're staying on site or one of the expensive hotels. Uh, that's, we do like going to Universal, and that's one of the things that really bugs me, though, is that, you know, if you stay on site, you just get the express pass, you get to walk right into everything, and that's, that's why I think Disney does it right. Uh, it would be kind of neat if they made a change where you got a magical moment out of um, the express machine, the fast pass machines. I think that would be a nice enhancement. But as far as treating guests differently, depending on how much money they spend, I just think that would be the wrong move for Disney. Hopefully they won't do it. But um, keep up the good work. Love the show. Bye-bye. Hey, Lou. It's Michael from from California. And I was uh, over at the Magic Kingdom last night for the Very Merry Christmas Party after spending a week at uh, at the uh, resort down here. And one of the bus drivers had let us know something very interesting, that the handicap lot over at MGM, which is soon to be the new Hollywood Studios, is being ripped up and uh, at starting the end of next month, apparently, uh, to make way for two new roller coasters. Now, they didn't say what the theming on those coasters would be. You may already have this information, but I thought I'd give you a call anyways. Uh, but they said it would take about five years to complete the project. And I know there's been a lot of rumors around about uh, some big announcement coming with regards to the parks, and uh, this may be it. So uh, just wanted to give you a heads up. Take care, keep up the good work, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.